Today's scripture reading is from Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. These all died, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the, the country from which they have they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. hear me through this one all right yeah okay i'm going to kind of be moving around a little bit i'm going to start up here like normal and then i'm going to move down there at the end can everybody see that board okay unless we need to move it or, or whatever but um so we'll kind of get started like normal and then like i said i'll move down there at the end i heard alice say as i was getting set up it looks like school so don't be too concerned about that. We won't be passing out grades or anything like that. Um, so I want to just want to welcome you guys here again while I get a few things out here. Um, welcome and happy Sabbath. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to meet together and worship with like believers. It's just something we take for granted in this country. Um, so I want to thank you all for taking the time to come out here. Um, and like I said, I'm going to move around, so hopefully David's not too mad at me because I'm not going to stay in one spot today, um, but we'll make you earn your money today. <laughs> I used to have a, I have a work with another teacher that he used to always tell kids if they volunteered for something, and they're like, well, we don't get paid. He's like, well, here's the deal. I will pay you today three times what I'm paying you. <laughs> in the past, so I will pay you three times what I'm paying you for today's services. All right, so let's get started with prayer and then let's dive right in. Dear Lord, I want to ask that you be with us today as we open your word, as we study your word today. I want to ask that you send the Holy Spirit to be with us so that we can uh, get a message that you want us to hear today. Help everyone to hear what they need to hear from you today. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so for the first part, we're going to do a lot of looking in the Bible. And I think I like to open the Bible up and search. I like to have you guys look up a lot of texts. Um, I was giving a sermon um, a couple weeks ago at Grand Island, and afterwards, um, I don't know if she was directing it at me or not, but Anita Cobb, who I've known for since I was a little kid, she said, well, it really bothers me when they only say the verse once and then they start reading it. So if you need more time to look it up or if I'm going too fast, please raise your hand and ask me to, to slow down because um, I want you to be able to follow along and I think it's a blessing to look up some texts. Um, so our scripture today was Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. We were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he prepared a city for them. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. So, what do you guys think of when you think of home? What are some things that you think of or what comes to mind when you hear the word home? Safety. 
Safety, good. Anybody else? Corn. Corn, okay. <laughs> so land, that, that was on my list, land. Good food. Food. Love. Love, good. Peace and quiet. Positive conversation. What was that one? Positive conversation. Positive conversation. I heard Alice say peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Food. Security. Food, security. Good. Sometimes, though, Alice, when you have the little kids, it's not always peace and quiet, is it? No, not that I don't have them at my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, good. Those are some good things. Um, I came up with houses, land, family, people. Love is a good one, I think I heard somebody say. Those are things we think of when we think of home. This is from the Adventist home. And it says, the mission of the church extends beyond its own members. The Christian home is to be an object lesson, illustrating the excellence of the true principles of life. Such an illustration will be a power for good in the world. As the youth go out from such a home, the lessons they have learned are imparted. Nobler principles of life are introduced into other households, and an uplifting influence works in the community. So the home should be kind of the center of Christian influence, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So let's look at what some of the early homes were like in the Bible. So let's look at Hebrews 11.9. And see what, what their homes were like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, 9. <coughs> and it says, By faith he dwelt in the land of promises as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise. Then let's flip back to Genesis 26.3. Genesis 26.3. And in Genesis 26.3 it says, Dwell on this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. What were their homes? What were Abraham's? What was his home like? Like the structure. A tent. They lived in tents, right? Do you think that made... Why, why did they live in tents? Because they moved. They moved, right? They moved around. A lot of nomadic tribes moved too. Um, a lot of early nomadic tribes. We talk about that in world history. We're talking about how people had to follow their food source in some cases. If you're herding, grazing. you have to follow grazing. If you're hunting, you have to follow the food. If the food moves, you have to move too. Um, so it was a little more of a different lifestyle. So their homes were more of a temporary structure that could be moved, right? Another very important part of their home that we might not think of as part of it, but let's look at it. Genesis 12, 8. So we're going to stay in Genesis here for a little bit. Genesis 12, 8. Mm -hmm. And it says, He moved from there to the mountains east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then let's just flip over to Genesis 13, 4. Genesis 13, 4. To the place, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abraham, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Let's look at Genesis 33, 20. Genesis 33, verse 20. Mm -hmm. Alright, verse 20 it says, There he erected an altar there and called, then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohi Israel. 
And then let's look at Genesis 35, 1 through 3. Genesis 35, 1 through 3. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of, the, of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. What's the common theme there in all those verses? Altar. Altar. So yeah, they're, they're, they lived in tents. They moved a lot. The structure was temporary. But the very first thing they did when they stopped somewhere was to build an altar to worship. Right? So worship was very important. So, our homes here are temporary too, right? Their homes were temporary. Uh, let's look at Genesis 47, 9. Genesis 47, verse 9. Genesis 47, verse 9. And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. It's interesting that they viewed their time on earth as a pilgrimage. What is a pilgrimage? Speak up, Alice. What? When you're going someplace, that's important. That's... Okay, you're going somewhere important. Or it could be going home. Okay. A, a pilgrimage is, is a religious journey, right? It's most, most commonly associated with a religious journey. So they viewed their life as a pilgrimage. Their time here on earth was a pilgrimage. It was temporary. It was, they were getting to that holy place on that pilgrimage. Psalms 119, verse 54. Psalm 119, verse 54. This is David, and he says, Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. So David, too, talking about his pilgrimage. All right, my next thing there is the world is not our home. So let's look at Hebrews 13, verse 14. Hebrews 13, verse 14. How many of you have heard that song that this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through? That kind of rolled through my head as I was thinking about of this. 13, verse 14. For we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. First Chronicles 20, or actually let's 16, that's our scripture. Let's do 1 Chronicles 29, 15. 1 Chronicles 29, 15. In verse 15, it says, For we are aliens and pilgrims before you. As were all our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Then we had our, our uh, scripture, and then let's go to 2 Peter 3, verse 13. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. And it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
So kind of a theme there is this world, we know this world's a bad place, we're here temporary, but we have hope that there's a better home coming, that we belong somewhere else, right? So now we're going to kind of shift gears and look at the things that should be found in a Christian home, things we should strive for. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that my, that my Christian home is better than anybody else's. We all have things we could work on. Um, so let's look in Genesis here again. What we're looking at, what is found in a Christian home? Genesis 8.20. Genesis 8.20. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So what did Noah do in his household? He built an altar. He built an altar. He worshipped God. This is after the flood, right? They were on that boat, tossing around for a while, long time, and the first thing they did when they got on land was what? Built an altar. They built an altar. Built an altar and worshipped the Lord. That, that kind of brought to my mind the, the summer after my sophomore year, I believe it was, I went on a mission trip to Mexico. Great experience. We went about six hours over the border to a place called Tampico. We worked in a very poor um, community. We were working on building a church there. I mean, we had people that lived in just whatever you could find, corrugated tin or whatever. You kind of make a little little hut, and that's where those people live. Um, we stayed in houses um, in the, I guess you would call, what they would say, wealthier part of town. Some church members kept us in their house. We actually slept on the roof. The boys slept on the roof, and it was open because it doesn't get... Like, I don't know, they don't have the elements we have to worry about. It just gets hot. So at night, it was kind of nice because you get that breeze across the roof. But, I, you know, you, we always hear that roosters only crow in the morning. Well, in Mexico, they crow all night. The dogs are barking and the roosters are crowing all night. But anyway, it was a great experience to go down there. But you couldn't eat the food. You couldn't drink the water because our bodies weren't used to it. And you would have some problems. Um... The first thing some of us did when we crossed over into Texas, and South Texas isn't all that great, but we crossed over into Texas. You know what some of us did, me and some of my friends? We did that whole cliche thing where you get off the bus and you kiss the ground. Mm -hmm. So we kissed the parking lot because we were happy to be back where we could drink water and, and not bottled water, things like that. But the first thing Noah did after being cooped up in that ark was to worship God, to be thankful. I mean... Everyone else had been wiped out. And Noah realized that God had saved him and they gave praise to God for that. Let's look at Genesis 22, verse 9. Genesis 22, verse 9. And they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound, his, bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Still within their family, they're worshiping God. And there's a lot to that story. You could preach a whole sermon on that story alone, on how that family was so dedicated to even go through the motions of starting to do something like that, of sacrificing their son that had been a promise of God. But worship was found in that family. All right, let's look at... Self-surrender. Let's look at Genesis 26, 25. Genesis 26, verse 25. And it says, So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. And then let's look at Romans. Flip back over to Romans. 12 verses 1 through 3. Romans 12 verses 1 through 3. 
So this is Paul in his letter to the Romans. In verse 1, it starts out, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God dealt to each one a measure of faith. So self-surrender. We are not any better than anybody else. And just to have that in our homes, to serve others and be self-surrendering. Then let's look at 1 Kings 18, verses 33 through 36. And we talked about this a little bit last week in Sabbath school. That's kind of where this kind of stemmed from, was the lesson last week. So, 1 Kings 18, 33 through 36. In 33 it says, And he put wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a, then he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And then he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran all down the altar, and also he filled the trench with water. And it came to pass that the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things in your word. Now that kind of confused me as to what Elijah had to do with family, family principles. Um, but as we learned in the lesson last week, Israel had kind of gone a long ways from what God's ideal plan was, right? And the thing that's, that they brought out that really kind of struck me was he let Baal, the priests of Baal mess around all day, right? He let them do what they were going to do to have their chance, right? But at the time of the evening sacrifice, is what the verse says, at the time of that evening worship, that the Israelites should have all been participating in already was the time that he chose to build the offering or have the offering to God. So that really kind of struck me as how important it is for that worship piece, individually, family, and as a church, to take that time to dedicate yourself to God. So worship and study were important. Biblical Christians, Bible Christians know we, all, we are all but pilgrims and strangers in this present world. They know that death disrupts their sojourn here. They know that this earth and the works are in will be burned up someday. Our sights reach beyond this sin-sick world. We have that hope, right? This isn't it. No Christian home can be complete without these essential things. The first one is worship and study. A specific meeting place for the family to study the Word of God and pray. If we look at Matthew 18, 20. Matthew 18, verse 20. And it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So you don't have to have a hundred people to make worship or study important, right? So those Bible studies or those church services with two or three people are just as important as the ones with a thousand people. All right. Acts 10, 1 through 9. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. In verse 1 it starts, it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, 
a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he had said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up to, for a memorial before God. Now send a man to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, who's by the house, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Then an angel who spoke to him had departed. Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to him, he sent them to Joppa. The next day as they went on their journey, they drew up near the city. Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So this was a Roman centurion who still, in his house, worshipped God and studied and worshipped with his family. Alright, so let's look here at a few biblical examples of families or family <coughs> principles. The first one we already read Genesis 8, 20 through 23, that would be who? We talked about the, the Noah and the ark. So Noah and his family, his dedication. Let's look then at Joshua 24, 15. So Noah would be a, an example of dedication. The first thing he thought of was to give thanks to God when they had been saved from the flood. Joshua... Twenty-four, fifteen. This is one of my favorite verses. I have a lot of favorite verses, but this one is kind of a call for families. And it came at kind of the crossroads of, of Israel. But let's Joshua twenty-four, fifteen. And it says, and if, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you look through the Old Testament, you look up through Israel from the time they were in Egypt on up through their whole journey, they always kept kind of toying with those idols and those other gods, the gods of the people around them, and on through Israel's history. And this was kind of a call of Joshua to say, hey, you have a choice you have to make. But as for me and my family, we're going to choose the Lord, but you've got to make up your mind what you're going to do. And I think in these days, we each have a choice we have to make too. You can't ride the fence. You can't serve two masters. All right, then let's look at what else a biblical example is on Acts 16, verse 34. Acts 16, verse 34. And it says, Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Who was this? I should have backed it up a little bit, but who is, what context is this in? Who is this person they talked about having served, believed in God with all of his household? The jailer. The jailer, right? So he made that choice, and then he profess to believe, right? He set food before them and rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. So we have to believe in something, right? You have to stand for something. You have to believe in something. You have to make that choice. So one of the activities that was suggested in last week's Sabbath School lesson about families was to do this little activity. And I'd like to have you guys help me with this. This will be a little different of a part. Um, Jake, can you go ahead and just read that? We don't need that anymore. <laughs> we're going to talk about family principles, and we're going to talk about um, making that choice. So, what was this week? What important thing happened this week in history? 
Fourth of July. What happened on the Fourth of July in 1776? Our from England. What? Signed the Declaration of Independence, okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to make, sorry, it's hot up here. We're going to make a Declaration of Family Principles, okay? What? Okay. All right, so we're going to make a Declaration of Family Principles. Who can tell me? How the Declaration of Independence starts. We the people. No. no. Good document, but that's <laughs> the Constitution. The that's right. Okay. Does anybody know how the how does the Declaration of Independence start? When in the course of human events. When in the course of human events. It becomes and, necessary. And this is probably paraphrasing. It becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands of another people. Blah blah blah. The point of the Declaration of Independence was to explain why. Okay, so they declared independence, and then they felt that they were obligated to explain why. Within that document, there was 27 specific grievances against King George that they had. And then, at the end of the document, again, they just explained why they were declaring independence from this. Um, I have my students do something similar to this. They do it more of in a breakup. They, we have them write a breakup letter to King George um, to declare that independence. So what does that have to do with family principles? So we're going to declare family principles. So in a good declaration, you need three parts. And the first part is a preamble, okay, which is the introduction. So in the Declaration of Independence, it was in the course, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary, blah, blah, blah. So what would a good introduction to our Declaration of Family Principles be? Any ideas? This is the part where we just throw stuff out there. What are the course of family life? Okay. To promote love in a safe environment. Okay. And we're going to get to the. Eh, we'll do that. Let's do. So, when in the course of family life. <laughs> you said to promote a. Love and a safe environment. Okay. When and the and then how are we going to finish that off for just the introduction part? Find the family together. To, to, serve, to serve God. So when in the course of family events to promote love in a safe environment, it becomes necessary to adhere to the principles or the commandments of God. Adhere to the commandments of God. Okay? Well, that's good. And we're not going to... Is there, there any English teachers in here? I teach social studies, so that's my excuse. Um, and I apologize for the handwriting, but I just thought I'd get kind of moving a little bit instead of me just talking up there. Thought about typing it on the screen, but sometimes I just like it on here better. And I wanted a little bit of interaction. So... Um, my handwriting is terrible. I tell my students that I write in code. And sometimes the code is so good I can't even read it. But what's the next part? What was the next part of the Declaration of Independence? This is where we have to be Constitution. 
<laughs> we have to be different document. It came a lot later after all that Article Confederation mess. All right. We need to declare our principles. We need to be specific in the principles that we're declaring. Remember that the colonists had 27 specific grievances with King George. I'm not going to ask you for 27, but I want some biblical family principles. What are some biblical family principles? We talked a little bit about this with what we think of as at a home. I'm going to put love up here. That's a biblical family principle, right? Any other ideas? Respect. Respect. Okay. No chastisement. No chastisement. Okay. Other principles. Family. Eat the proper food. Okay, health. Diet. Good. Service. Service. Service to who? Service to your family and your family. So, service. Family. Community. And? Country? Church. Or God. And hey, God, right? Church? God? Good. Any other biblical family principles? Generosity. Generosity. Obedience. Obedience. Care. Go back up to the obedience one. You remember that verse in the Bible that says, Children, obey your parents? Mm -hmm. That's all it says, right? No. The parents have a responsibility. What's the parents' responsibility? Uh, what? Provoke your children. You're not supposed to provoke your children either. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's not like, I'm the parent, you have the, but there's kind of a, you know, if you serving God, that should be pretty clear to you. Right? That doesn't mean you let your kids do whatever they want either. <laughs> Other principles. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Worship. Worship. Any others? I think that's a pretty good list. Love each other. A lot of these could tie in together. Love each other. Respect each other. And God. Love God. Respect God. No chastisement. Health and diet. Live a life as a family of service. You serve your family. Serve your community. Your country. Serve God. Be generous to your neighbors. Be generous to each other. Yes. Safety. Safety. Good. That's a very good one. Safety and protection. I think the other so, thing should be time together. Time okay, family time together. Time, family time. time management. So, time together in several different things. I will back up here quick, but safety and protection, thank you for that one. That is awesome. The family should be a safe place, right? Home should be a safe place. We should protect the home from those influences of the world. How many of us live in a perfect community? Okay? We have to protect the family from sin, from that outside influence. This time together should be in worship of God, right? Not just that too, but it should just be spending time together, getting to know each other as a family, playing board games, working together. I grew up in a family where work was very important, and it is. I'm glad that I learned those skills. We worked together as a family. So these are very important. And what about long suffering? Long suffering. That means you suffer for a long time, right? 
No, long suffering, patience, right? That is very important, and that's hard. As a parent, that's hard. I mean, my kids are here, but so I won't try to embarrass anybody, but that can be a very hard thing sometimes to have that patience. But we have to look at who has who's the best example of patience. Jesus. God, right? Of the patience that God has had with the human race is amazing. Okay? And that patience and that long suffering that comes out of love and respect. Right? And believe it or not, protection, safety. Okay. Well, I think we have a pretty good list. Anybody we're missing anything? I mean, there's we could go on, we could list a lot, but I think this is a very good list. So if we were going to write this all out, we would write our introduction. When in the course of family life, to promote love in a safe environment, it becomes necessary to adhere to the commandments of God. And then we would lay out these principles that we've chosen. And then at the end, we would explain why we think that's important. So who can tell me why it's important to adhere to these principles as families, as individuals, and as a church? It makes life a lot easier. Okay, it makes life a lot easier. Right? Now, we do know this is a temporary life. We do know that there's better things in store. But, this is kind of God's plan to help us as families to, like Alice said, make life a little bit easier. That doesn't mean you're never going to have problems. Doesn't mean you're not going to have challenges. But it's just that, that living God's plan. The Ten Commandments existed since when? To the beginning of time. Since the creation, since the beginning of time. And it's pretty clear that the Israelites, even before God gave them on the stone, knew the principles, the ten principles that God laid out for humans. Okay? So why is that important? To make life easier. To give us a guide. To give us support. Family can be a very strong support system, right? Everyone at some point in their life is going to need support of some kind, right? Family is a good place for that. Also, we refer to church sometimes as family, right? Your church family. So these can apply to that too. So I think we need to all leave here today with just kind of a prayer in our hearts to look at our lives and our families and our church and see how we can apply some of these principles, how we can pray for help in some of these areas so that we can declare to the rest of the world, hey, we're done with sin. We want to live a life of service to God, a life of love with God. And this is how we're going to do it.